Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, depending on where you are. And welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. And in a few minutes, I'm going to be chattering with Brad Watson. But before we do that, uh, I'd just like to uh, give you some announcements. Uh, firstly, just to say that the 13 horror sorry, the 13 videos that I've been working on for the London Horror Festival um, are now live, and I'll be posting links to those in the next uh, few days. I've interviewed most of, uh, quite a few of the um, companies who are actually performing in this year's festival, um, and there's some really interesting shows there. Um, I'd also like to announce, and I literally learned this yesterday morning, that The Night Whispered, my short film, will be screening at uh, slash and Bash Horror and Sci-Fi Film Festival in Topeka, Kansas. And that's going to be on the weekend of the 7th of 8th of October. Sadly, I won't be there because I'm going to be here in, uh, at another screening of The Night Whispered uh, and Spooky Empire, uh, along with my fellow Cenobites. Uh, so we're going to be there. Uh, there's going to be a, there's a slight change of program for next week's show because I'm going to be joined by Sean Robert Smith, who is the director and writer, and Craig Conway, the writer and star of the film Broken, which also premiered at uh, Fright Fest this year. Um, didn't actually get to see that one, um, so I've got to, I'm going to be seeing that before then. Um, and I'm delighted to announce that Doug Bradley is going to be joining me on the 2nd of October. Uh, so just to remind people that Fabio Fritzi is joining me on the 16th of October, and tomorrow I will be setting up a method for you to log your questions beforehand. Um, that's Fabio Fritzi, who is the... Um, a composer of the Lucio Fulci uh, Italian giallo movies. Um, but obviously, uh, he's Italian. Uh, he's not that confident with his English. Uh, so he's asked that we get questions in beforehand. So I will set that up. Uh, apologies for not being able to set it up this week. So I ended up by editing an awful lot of videos. Um, and just remind people that if you'd like to see Mindless, Remnant, and Rats, all of which I star in, uh, plus some, uh, lots of other films, do come along to Spooky Empire and meet the rest of my fellow Cen Cenobites. And that's going to be on the 7th to the 9th of October in Orlando, Florida. <sighs> I think I did that mostly on one breath. <laughs> anyway, right. Uh, Brad, good evening. Good evening. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing well. <laughs> I'm doing very well. <laughs> Today was um, my husband and Craig. It was our it's our sixth anniversary for our civil partnership. Oh, lovely! Congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we had a really really lovely lunch, uh, and then we came back and I did some pointing of brickwork. So sounds <laughs> like magic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A really romantic way to spend your <laughs> your anniversary, basically. Um, uh, particularly as I learned my pointing skills thirty years ago. <laughs> Something <laughs> I taught by my dad um, thirty years ago. But cool. Um, so I'm well. How are you? What have you you've been doing? Anything exciting today? I know. Um, uh, I've been I've been on a, sh a shoot all weekend. But um, not mine. Uh, I stepped in to uh, at the last minute to help a friend of mine out uh, who was doing some shooting uh, to do with the BFI. So I, I, I stepped in to help, letting him know that I was booked to come and see you uh, tonight. <laughs> hence, hence I've literally just got in. So, uh, yeah. So yeah. So I just, I just, I chucked the lights up and that. So I, so I hope this. Yeah. You know, hope you can see me and hear me. Okay. We can both see you and hear you beautifully, and we can see. Um... A, a beautiful poster prompt as to what we're going to be talking about first uh, in the background Hallow's Eve which I got to see uh, um, uh, I can't even see <laughs> Fright <laughs> Fest <laughs> <laughs> yeah just you know old age is obviously fumes from doing pointing a brickwork um, yeah yeah so Tell me how, uh, talking about Hallow's Eve, I wish I really enjoyed it, and I particularly enjoyed it as this was a cast and crew screening almost, is that right? Well, yeah, kind of. Well, we, we, we've had a couple of screenings that have been cast and crew screening, but basically we, because we, we were shooting uh, in February, March, so we, we literally um, got the movie finished right on the Friday Fest deadline, which was... Or, or right on the deadline to deliver our final DCP to them, which was a week before the screening. Um, so it was literally the first time the film had been screened to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Wow. I'd, I mean, I'd only watched it once, and that was just to check it. 
um, in terms of seeing the final picture and sound together. Uh, so yeah, so it was kind of a chance to to get some of the some of the main cast to come along and and uh, and for us to for them to see it in a nice cinema environment and with an audience that were going to appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so so yeah, so we we used it a little bit uh, for that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, um, incidentally, so just before we go a little bit further on that, Kim Lehman, thank you very much indeed. Hey, Nicholas, happy 29th anniversary of Hellraiser being released today. Um, I suppose you should acknowledge that anniversary as well. That it is. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're trying to work out when we actually filmed it. We, I know it was in October, uh, November. Mm. Um, we're trying to actually find people who might actually have call sheets so we can work out, because it, obviously it's 30 years yeah. um, since we, we, we actually filmed it. So, uh, sorry, complete aside. Uh, fine. Um, <laughs> so, Harry's a huge influence on yourself. <laughs> good. Good, yeah, good, good. So, uh, literally... <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time you've seen it. But obviously you've been working with an editor up until this point before you had to deliver the well, DCP. I but um, uh, so the, well, well, the thing is, when you, when you make a movie like this, especially the way, you know, and you're saving as much money as you can. And so I, I you know, we all bring as much as we can to the party. Um, so I cut, I was the editor for the movie as well, um, which is, you know, which is fine. But it means that you go through this period of you're shooting the movie and, you, and you're, you're spending your every every second of your life being the center of about 35 other people's worlds and they're the center of yours and then suddenly uh it, boom it's just you sitting there with the movie everyone else is moving on to other things and you're just sitting there beavering away trying to make movies so you have this little sort of crazy little man in a in a dark room paranoid period sort of cutting the film together and then when you've got the picture lock and then your sound designer starts coming on board and then visual effects people start coming on board and then the sound uh mix and then and then you end up migrating to a a uh, post-production company in, in which creatives in media in tower bridge uh so then you spend the final part of the movie you know being social with other people which is lovely um but yeah but there is a period where literally it's just me and I, so i i you know, I'd show the, the cut to a couple of people, um, most notably my the, the director of photography, uh, Bob Holwell, who who co-produced the film with me. Um, you know, just to see that I was going in the right direction with things. But uh, but other than that, yeah, it was just me for a little while, um, and then and then the whole post-production crew comes on for the final sort of month of grading and and, and sound mixing. So, how long did you spend by yourself editing editing it? I was I was really sitting on my own from uh, end of March, end of March to beginning of July, um, with a few days of pickups in in uh, right. where I'd organise people. And I'm sure I deliberately left some shots out so I had an excuse to bring everyone together again for a couple of days so I could see everyone. <laughs> but, so, um and were you literally spending every day editing or you um, have to fit this around other work and yeah i mean work? you're fitting it around other stuff you you you've got i mean you, you know you with a, with a tiny budget like this you you allow yourself a little bit of of uh, you know sort of token living money to help you out but you, you want to supplement that as well with, with sort of things when you're when you're doing it because we because we shot a third of the movie completely off our own backs um, a year and a half ago, uh, in order to uh, cut that together and then go out and raise or attempt to raise the money to uh, to complete the film, um, which we did. So I spent basically a year doing that. Um, you take you know taking it to Cannes and talking to various producers, various things nearly happen and then don't, and you know, and, you, and before you know it, you know, nearly a year's gone by. But then then suddenly you know something happens and. And uh, and the money starts to happen, and then you're just throwing everyone up, going right, guys, we're we're doing it. Yep, I wasn't mad, I wasn't crazy. We are going to finish this movie, and then uh, yes, and then and then we were back in front of the cameras for February, March. Uh, so so in that, but it's just saying in those circumstances, you are using every you know you like I said, I'm editing it. I don't intend to edit all my movies. It was just literally it was a series really to you know bring the resources in. My deep my DP Bob can bring in he's got all the camera you know we were shooting on on the uh, uh, red 
epic dragons and and using the you know the best lenses and lights and everything and he could bring all that to the party and uh, and it's also why i wrote the, the score as well it was it was you know primarily to save money <laughs> but but i did i did audition myself to make sure i was going to be happy with what, what the hell i was going to do but um but yeah but literally it was bring bring all our resources together and you are you're doing it as cost effectively as possible which means you're doing it around other things as well and bringing in a little bit more money to, to help yourself out yeah just so you can eat at the end of the day so you can eat. yes okay, okay well i'm, I'm going to wind the story back at Okay. In a, a, a bit in a, in a few moments but before just a couple of technical questions what did you edit on what software and machine are you using um i, I cut it on premiere pro right the latest uh, premiere pro uh, cc cloud um um i used to be a final cut seven guy uh -huh. i'm not going to bad mouth anyone over the internet but and they changed it to Final Cut 10, and I think most people familiar with it, editing systems know, know what happened then. Everyone went, whoa, over to Premiere. It's quite, yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite, so uh, what resolution did you, did you shoot at in that case? We, shoot, we were shooting mainly at 5K. Right. Um, the Red Dragon, the Red Dragon shoots 6K, but we, you know, it, that, that just got a bit ridiculous. Um, you know, I mean, we knew we were going to mark, the, the Finch was going to mark with 2K. Um, uh, but the thing about shooting at 5K is, and it's not, it's not that I, I uh, it's not that this is a plan or a habit of mine, but it's just that when you're really up against it and you're shooting at 5K and you're shooting your, you know, your, your mid shot, you're kind of getting your close up as well. You know, you can right. punch in. So it's like, if you, you know, if you're like, right, okay, don't worry, we're getting everything we need. Um, so that's, that's the advantage of shooting at that resolution and why I like shooting on red. Um, obviously we, you know, we, we did a few shots on Alexa as well. Um, uh, but, uh, um, but, we, but I, I kept it to red for the resolution. I, I love Alexa and I'll, I'll, I'll happily shoot movies on Alexa. But, um, but for me, I think when, if you're doing a lower budget and you're trying to maximize everything you can, that resolution of the red, uh, red dragon is, is pretty, pretty useful. Right, right, right. Did you, you're saying, so you're, you're outputting at what, 1080p? Um, the, the final, the final output is 2K. It's 2K, uh, right? Yeah, for the DCP and the projection. Obviously, we're we're still working on the final deliverables for everything else, in which there will be 1080 version, right? And and there will still be standard def versions as well. Right, yeah. right. Did I, that I, really I want to see, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, we have to supply them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I, I, I know from having tried to deal with, um, uh, I think we would. I mean, yeah, I was shooting in 4K when we yeah. were doing Night Whisper, and, and again, absolutely, it's that thing. And you know, it it's it's really common practice now because it does mean that you can move so yeah. much faster yeah. just by doing the one setup and doing like that. Did did you have, therefore have to spend a lot of time waiting for stuff to resolve and just process on the machine, or were you able to? Uh, really, I mean, the, the the new Premiere is pretty good at letting you start to start to play with the footage natively um mm -hmm. you know it, it's a bit clunky in it and every now and again it goes hang on a second let me render a bit okay right and then, you know, every now and then it will do that but um yeah. but it does let you start getting in there quite quickly and then and then all you need and then you, you can start compiling things and then let it render overnight and then suddenly it's it's all much more user friendly but but it, i found it i found it of Fairly easy, simple workflow. Um, mm. But um, but the one thing I will say to any anyone out there that, that hasn't gone through that process yet, but is going to, when you sync your your sound and your picture up, do not use the merge clip thing because that buggers up your EDLs later. If you're going to be grading uh, uh, on, right. uh, we we graded on base like in at, at this lovely facility, but it it didn't. It didn't like the fact that I'd done merge clips and couldn't separate the the original clips. Anyway, yeah, technically, but anyone out there that's listening that is into that, just quick heads up because that almost that almost fried my brain. But really, yeah. really, yeah. yeah no, I mean that's very that's very useful to know, uh, very useful to share. Um, uh, there was one comment you, uh, you just gave as well, which I'm interested by. You said you auditioned yourself 
for composing the music. Yeah. <laughs> what, yes. what did that involve? <laughs> well, well, but, well, because because I I thought well I you know I can do this sort of thing and I knew what I was trying to do. You know, I would never you know compose you know anything that was a for orchestral squad. I know plenty of great guys that can do that, but because I was. I was aiming for this John Carpenter vibe and I was aiming for that 80s vibe and I knew I wanted to to do that. And, you know, this is a year and a half ago, you know, you know before Stranger Things. So hopefully, I, you know, kind of kind of in line with things now. But um, um, so what I did was I, I, I thought about, OK, we'll write a couple of pieces. So I wrote two themes um, and, and, you know, and arranged them and put them together. And then I just had them on my phone so that every time I was out walking the dog, I could just listen to it and just keep just keep wondering is is this as good as I think it is? Does this work as well as I you know? And because you you always think of that, and then and then I start slipping it into some of the uh, materials because I had a sales agent on board at the start. I, I wasn't going to do this hairbrain scheme without that. Um, but Movie House, who who sold my last movie um, very well uh, to nearly twenty countries, um, uh, they read the script and they were very happy with it and they thought great and I was I remember I was at a meeting with them in Cannes and and we were talking to some other producers and I was talking about the John Carpenter vibe and everything and everyone kept saying oh, are you going to do the music then because the God does his own scores so I kept thinking hmm it would be it would be cheaper it would be handy um so yeah so we auditioned myself and then I start and then when we had the, the first sort of trailers to go out to take to potential investors and that that I gave to Movie House. Um, I I snuck in my score that I'd written onto those without saying anything, just to just to see what people thought. And a lot of people came up going, going, the music's great. You know, so I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe I can get away with this. And uh yeah, and then basically then I was kind of locked into it and off we went. So for better or for worse, I mean I don't know. I get some good comments about the music, but I, you know, obviously, no one, people will be too frightened to say bad things to me about it. But, um, uh, but I think it works. I think it works. It's interesting because I think when you're directing stuff, normally, you know, the workflow is you, you do you've got your final picture lock. That's maybe when you hand it over to the composer, yeah. so that they can start working out beat tracks and they can work out in their minds what you know where you might put in music. You're editing, you're going to be composing. Did you follow that kind of order of things? Or was it all kind of a mismatch? You've now got stuff going through your head as you're editing. Um, no, I have to I have to say that I don't necessarily do it in that order. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm a lover of uh, film music and I'm a lover of movies that use music and use scores really well. You know, I, I, you know certain, and I love movies that, let themselves breathe with music a bit and let this, you know, you know, a classic case in point, Elliot going off the, on his bike with ET, you know, and you have that whole sequence that is just, you know, mind blowingly great. And it's just images and music doing its thing. And, um, uh, but in the right way. And, um, so I, I, I do often start listening, even when I'm right before I've written a script, I start listening to music to inspire me to help me shape shape it because i think me films films are very similar to music i think films are, are more similar to music than they are the written word um i think because there's a there's a structure and a beat and a flow to movies that i like anyway there's you know there's all there's all different kinds of ways to make movies and uh, the movies that i like there, there seem there seems to be a, a musical feel to the whole thing even when there's no music there um, so I do start with the music, um, what kind of music, it, does, it, it can evolve and turn into something else, but I'm kind of, um, even when I'm writing, if I've got a blank page in front of me, if I haven't got a, a music idea in there, I'm, I'm totally alone, I've got nothing, you know, so I start with these ideas of music and it helps me construct scenes and things like that, and so I do, uh, I do think of the music right up the front, so I, so so doing the music myself on this was definitely um, uh, not no change in the process for me whatsoever. Um, I am very I work very very closely with my composers when I when I do use composers and I, and uh, 
um, I'm, I have quite solid ideas uh, about the music. So, um, yeah, so so basically, short answer, uh, no, I, I did things exactly the way we do. And, uh, well, it's very interesting. You, you work in a very similar way, uh, way to my guest last week, James Moran. Oh. Who oh, okay. says, yeah, he was saying yeah. that exactly the same thing. Yeah. One of the first things he does is put together the playlists. Yes. Literally, you know, if he's writing a thriller, then he will put together a, you know, a list of yeah. thrillers type songs and, and yes. music and, yeah. and so on. Um, Absolutely. I do that. I have my playlists on my phone for different projects that I'm writing or have written or, or, or scripts that I've read. I, I have those playlists. So I listen to them, and uh, um, so yeah, exactly the same. Uh, you, 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 because it's because it's emotional. Filmmaking is emotional. Um, you can inte inte you know intellectualize the plot and the structure of a script as much as you like, but it, it's an emotional thing, and nothing's more emotional than music as a starting point for a feeling that you're trying to get. And and you and you, and you listen to a piece of music, and you're like, okay, if I can. If I can earn this kind of feeling in my movie, how do I do that? So it's kind of a starting point. I want to earn this sort of moment, and then you, and then you sort of go work backwards from that, and and see if it works. I don't know. It's the way I work. Whether whether it's any good or not, I don't know. I'll be the judge of that. Well, as I say, you know, James does exactly the same thing. I think it's obviously. Yeah, I think a lot of directors do. Yeah, I think a lot of filmmakers do. Yeah, yeah. That was interesting. I mean, when I told the same story before when I was writing Hellraiser comics, I always used to put on Christopher Young's Hellraiser thing. Yeah. Because it just takes you straight there. You know exactly, yeah. I know exactly the world yeah. I'm in if I'm yeah, listening to Hellraiser. Oh, I love that score. It's so good. Yeah. It, it really is, you know, it, it's just so evocative. Mm. You know, yeah. And yeah. It just, it just stirs really the imagination. You listen mm. to stuff. Imagination stirs. And I do believe I come up with stuff that I would never come up to if I was sitting there in silence trying to bash things out in my brain, you know. Right, right. Okay, well, funnily enough, we've got a question coming from Joe V. There have been many memorable music videos made. As a director of music videos, is the vision for the video yours, or does the band have some input? Um, it's uh, either way. It can, happen, it can happen both ways. You can be given a, a brief to work to, um, and that brief can be quite detailed sometimes very very detailed and sometimes um it's very very general um I, I i i work and i and the thing is then you come in and you and the thing is is obviously it's a brief that's written by people that don't make videos themselves or don't understand the logistics involved and the realism of how what you can achieve and sometimes people are surprised by what you can achieve on on a certain amount of money and sometimes people are surprised what you can't achieve on a certain amount of money so I can I can blow things up. I can do an an action scene on a very low budget music video, but someone driving a car down a street at night and they interact with people on the street, that's almost impossible to do on a low budget if you want to make it look slick. Because you've got to have control of the street, you've got to do all that. Otherwise it's gonna be very guerrilla. So you have to you go through this with people when they have their detailed briefs of what they think they can achieve, and then you end up destroying it and rewriting it and, and but finding out what it is they're trying to do and then there's been other videos where literally the track i did i i, I did a trilogy of videos for the stereo mcs a while ago right. if you remember them they had a a a, 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 a a an album come out and they they and they uh, just put three tracks out for directors to pitch on and i picked and i very cheekily came up with an idea of pitching on all three and having a linking story, having it like three episodes. Um, and they loved it and they just went for it. And that, so that was just totally generating from me, just listening to music, no brief, no nothing. So it, you know, it can happen either way. And, uh, uh, and I, I quite like, obviously I, I prefer it if I can come in and have, you know, generate the idea myself. But sometimes, you know, people come in with briefs and there's, there's something very interesting about it. And you're like, I would never have thought of that. So yeah, I let, let's make it because that's something I wouldn't have thought of myself. So so it can happen either, either way. And it and it's just as much fun either way. It's all, all down to who you're working with, really. Right, right. Yeah, this is your question. <laughs> I think it does. No, I think that that, that, that answers it very clearly. Um, Kim, I'm going to come back to your uh, second question a little bit later on. Uh, what 
let's just ro roll back on uh, Hallow's Eve now. We're going to go yeah. back to the very, very beginning. You know, you're obviously th this is you wrote this. Therefore, this is your idea to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's <laughs> So how, so take it from there. You said that you you've been working with your sales agent and you'd filmed a third of the movie uh, to begin with. So how, lay well, this out for well, me. Okay. Well, well. So originally, so I I had a movie come out a f quite a few years ago now um, that was here in the UK. It was called The Seventh Dimension. It's called Beacon Seventy Seven in most places, um, and. Um, and and you know and it, it went out to twenty countries. It did, did okay. We were doing all right. So I've got all these other projects that we're like, right, okay, let's let's get going. You know? And they all start getting into development. Certain kinds of development. They all need a certain amount. Excuse me. They all need a certain amount of money um, to get going. So they go. So you go through you know what what you call development hell, and things nearly happen, and then they don't, and then they nearly happen again. And don't and years start going by and you're like okay um what's going on um so i i literally said right okay well so i've got these other projects sort of you know very slowly pushing forward i want to come up with a an idea that that we can that i don't have to wait for anyone else to get going on to at least like i said shoot a third of it i mean my original idea was to shoot half of it but you know that's you know that was that was reaching a little bit but um uh so i so i'd had this seed of the idea and um but i wasn't sure what to do with it and then um, um and i didn't i wasn't that particular idea wasn't you know i wasn't sitting down forcing that i was just i was just sitting down one day and the idea of of that concept through the lens of a John Carpenter type uh, 80s feeling horror movie, suddenly it all came into focus. So I I sat down in a coffee shop and wrote it, and I was like, and I don't usually write stuff on my own. I'm not, you know, I I, I think I'm an okay writer, but I I, I don't hundred percent trust myself as a writer. But for some reason, I just thought this is something that I I think I've got this start to finish. So I did so. Yeah, so I wrote it, and I then approached the uh, well. The very first person I approached was was Robert Bob Bob, call him uh, Bob Horwell, uh, who's who's the DP, who's who's a guy that runs his own company called Indie Film Hire, and they they uh, so he's got you know he hires out to a lot of independent movies, you know, all the latest red cameras, Alexas, and uh, all he's got the greatest lenses, he's got. You know, and, and all that. So I, I approached um, Bob because I, I knew him for a while because I, I'd hired lenses off him. I'd, I'd we'd associated for a few years with me hiring stuff off him for my music videos and stuff like that. And um, and he'd mentioned to me some time ago. He said, "Well, you know, we should do something together, Brad." You know, he said, "I like you know, I like the the, the vibe of the stuff you do." So, you know, he said, um, "So if you you know if you come up with a project that we could collaborate on, let's do it." So I I banked that suggestion. Um, and I, was, I thought I'm not going to waste that on a music video or something like that. I'm, that means that's something that I'm not going to squander. Um, so I sat on that suggestion. So then when I had this, when this script came up, I approached Bob and said, you remember when you said to me, let's do something together? Well, here's my idea. And I pitched the idea to him of us doing it this way and us getting, you know, at the time I was saying half the movie shot um, off our own backs. Um, and yeah, he didn't hesitate. He he was he he absolutely thought, why the hell not? You know, let's do it. Let's let's keep things moving. Let's let's uh, you know, because you, you you don't want to be stagnant. You're always you know pushing forwards, and you always want to keep the train moving forwards. And 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 Bob totally agreed with that. And he said, yeah, let's do it. Um, and I said, I said, well, I'm gonna you know obviously chat to Movie House because I'd, I'd be very nervous doing this if we didn't have some kind of sales industry support um uh, uh, so i approached movie house and yeah they said look right if you think you can do it do it and we'll happily tell people where we're, we're attached for sales um if that helps you raise the money uh, on the other end of this so yeah so then all of a sudden it was like okay um now the one thing the one main element that was missing that i needed i mean not not 
other than the cast, but I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about them in a minute, um, was a location to do this section of the movie where we, we had no money, we were doing it off our own back. And, um, and, and I, so I deliberately had designed the movie, the second half, where, the, where most of the meat is, to happen in an abandoned factory. Um, so, I, I, so to me it was like, okay, if I, can, if I can get a location that can be that to, to help us out, for this period, then we could shoot that whole section of the movie. Um, so yeah, so that that proved to be fun trying to find a location that was going to you know be cheap enough um, but cinematic enough for us to do it. And um, and eventually I came I I because I, I I'm from Essex I, I live in Essex and there's a and there's a, um, a, a quite a legendary place down the road called the Secret Nuclear Bunker, and uh, and it's it's quite well known. Because uh, of all the road signs saying "secret nuclear bunker this way," which obviously is very funny, and uh, and they actually get they actually got. I was told by the guy that owns this place that um, one of their biggest marketing hit they ever got was when George Takei uh, saw this picture. Someone tweeted it to him, and he thought it was hilarious. So George Takei tweeted it, and then their their attendances to to visit just went through the roof. But that's a, that's another story. Um, and uh, uh, so I chatted with those, explained to them what I was doing and, and how they would be helping out some poor local filmmaker if they let us come in at a nice cheap rate to uh, to shoot this section of the movie. And, and that, it's cinematic as hell in there. It's great. There's long corridors and everything that was all done in there. And um, uh, so, yeah, so bam. So when that was on board, everything was on board. It was just a question of getting everyone together. Um, I cast it. Everyone knew the deal. Everyone knew what I was doing. All the agents knew exactly what was happening up front and what the deal was, and, and that you know this was a risk that we you know we were going to now we were going to make a part of the movie, try and raise the money. I can't guarantee that it's actually going to happen, but I feel that we've got as good a shot as anyone. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we were off and running to the races, and we shot that section of the movie. I was I was thrilled with what we were getting i mean we you know we, we grip wise we, we had this uh, this this piece of equipment called aronian which you you might have come across it's yeah. like a steady hand yeah but it's it's yeah. kind of a handheld thing and i and i like them that they're they're kind of um they're a bit glitchy and they're a bit temperamental um and you do find yourself waiting for them to start working a few times but when they do they feel more like a track and dolly than a steady cam to me and that's what you know why I loved it. So we we were getting we were so here we were shooting a section of this movie off our own backs, and we were getting these amazing, beautiful, you know, running down the corridor shots, tracking shots. It's really good, you know, money shots we were getting in that section. And I'm like, oh, yes, this is going to look great. We're going to really impress people with what, what we've managed to do. And that's kind of so it was kind of designed that way that we were going to get those sort of shots in this period, so that we had an impressive reel of the film to then go out and pitch to the money people um and uh yeah and that's 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 how it happened okay yeah I, i'm very familiar with the ronin we used it on a short film called rats um, oh, and, yeah. <laughs> when we're filming in a castle and all i remember about the ronin is watching the camera go <laughs> yes <laughs> Ronnie Ronnie doesn't want to play anymore. Just <laughs> Ronnie doesn't want to play. The camera's yeah. just gonna go. Just. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's like, okay. yeah. <laughs> but it's it's uh, but it, it's it's a great tool when it's working. It's a great tool, and it, and it really did push out push the the, the production value way up, way yeah. up. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was I was happy with it. I just think I just think next time I, if, we, if we just had two on the set, so when one's playing up, the other one can come in. But um, but yeah, but they're they're, they're really good tools, and yeah, uh, yeah I mean, the film wouldn't look as good without it. There's no yeah. about it. So okay, so how long did you? How long were you filming for? What was your shoot period when you did the initial? The initial the initial was ten days, right? But it uh, but it was it was split up. We had we shot a couple of days before Christmas because Sarah, my lead actress, uh, wasn't available for certain days so we had to bring a couple of days forwards before so that was in christmas 2014 and then we shot the rest of it so january through january february so that was eight days kind of staggered through january and february um, because obviously 
you know, everyone's doing it on their own back, no one's getting paid. So it's, you know, you're kind of doing it like at weekends or around people's schedules or, you know, you're trying to make it work that way. Um, but but everyone was, you know, was was 100% on board and, and, and fantastically dedicated. And, um, and yeah, the film wouldn't have got made if, if they hadn't because that's, that's we got some really, really good stuff in that period. And then how long did your actors then have to wait before you were able to get the money so that you could actually do the, the latter, well, not the latter two thirds in terms of the actual yeah. film itself, but the... Sure, yeah. Um, well, if we're, we're saying, yeah, so, so we're saying 2015, February 2015, uh, we, we, we finished shooting that section. And then um, it was... I think she'll probably remember better than me, but I I I, I rang up Sarah, uh, who plays Cassie, the lead. I think it was November that I rang her up and said, "Right, I'd or I I had everyone was getting little updates. I think sort of around by I think about August I sent everyone an update saying, just to let you know, there's been some things happen that that have then fallen apart. So it's not been I've not been quiet. I've just not been able to." give any definiteness and I didn't want to raise everyone's hopes until I could. Um, and then, then probably October was when the, the way we got it financed looked like it was going to happen. And I was, I literally was able to send emails to everyone saying, right. Okay. It's not a hundred percent yet guys, but it's looking good. Um, and then it would have, then it would have been November. Like she started talking to them and saying, right, it looks like we're going to be shooting sort of February, March of next year. Um, what are your schedules like? Let's let's start making up a schedule because hopefully I'm going to have the money confirmed very soon. And then it was December that it was a done deal. Bam! Right, right. And the money. It, where did you find your cast? Because they're quite young. Yes, yes. Most of them. Are. Yeah, I I I auditioned them. I sent out the brief to agents and spotlight and people like that and and a lot of agents got back to me with their suggestions and i i just did auditions you do you know like days and days of auditioning people and, it, and it's very very tough because you're especially you know with the gang i'm trying to create a dynamic and i'm you know you're trying to get people together and you, you see some wonderful people but but for some reason they don't click in with other people as well as other you know it's 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 like a jigsaw puzzle you're, you're, you're fitting together. And um, um, it, it, so, yeah, so but literally I auditioned them and, uh, and found them that way through agents sending them to me to the auditions, but they, with the exception of Sarah, who plays Cassie. Right. She, um, I, 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 I met, I knew her and I'd met her um, through a, a, a mutual friend who was screening a film at the BFI and she turned up and I was literally writing the film at that point. And she just sort of walked up and said hi and sat down next to me and we started chatting. And in the back of my mind, I was like, I think, I think Cassie just sat down next to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, so I kind of had it. And it wasn't a done deal. I, I saw lots of other people to play that role because you don't, you know, you, you have that initial thought about someone, but you, you know, you've got to, you've got to be up sure especially at the lead yeah um so i did see a lot of other people and, and and there was a lot of people that nearly you know i had other people that would have been great and and there was a scheduling conflict that did happen and i i nearly almost did nearly go with somebody else um but but that got sorted and uh and um and then she was on and she's been like you know you know fantastic the, you know, and one hundred percent with the movie right from the start. You know, and I think I think she's had a good time doing it. So we'll see. <laughs> did you use a casting director, or did you do it all yourself? I did it all myself. Yeah, I did it all myself. I I, I really, really, really don't want to do it in that way anymore. Um, I would like the casting director to help me because it's it's really tough. I think casting is. Casting and writing are the two areas of making a movie that I do, and I and I because I want to do it. Um, but it's really it's the period where when that's over, it's like thank God, yeah, really hard. It's really tough. And casting is uh, you know especially if you're you know to have a casting director that you can that can bring people in that can 
kind of see people a little bit ahead of you and filter out a few, but also someone that you can bounce ideas off and you can chat with and you can talk about that. You know, when it's when you're doing it yourself, you're kind of you know, you're kind of trusting your own judgment. I had friends and I had other people come into casting sessions with me so I could talk to them and because it's it's a big mistake to do any anything in the film business. It's a big mistake to be an island. You've got to you've got to bounce ideas off people. Even if you don't agree with their their things, it helps you work things out yourself. Um but yeah, definitely next time casting director for sure. For sure. <laughs> Well, yeah, I can imagine just how difficult that was going to be. So you then, you mentioned that the second one in the film is, yeah, the big building. But another massive location you've got is the estate itself. Where did you find that? Or is that just around the corner? Uh, no, that that's actually in Watford. Um, that uh, My location manager, uh, Derek Harrington, he, he found that, or he knew, knew it, and and it was quite local to him. And as a complete coincidence, I shot exterior location of my last movie in that very same estate. And I didn't realize it until we, until I first went to see it. You'd be talking about this estate in Watford and I was like, and then and when we walked out, I was like, oh my God, there's the tower blocks that we used on my last movie. Um, and uh, it was, uh, yeah, so he found it. He knew that they were, relatively experienced at having film crews around. Um, so he knew the right people to talk to. And because when you're doing a movie on such a low budget, you you, you can't afford hassle. It's, it's got to be as smooth sailing as it possibly can be because you can't chuck money at any problems. So uh, so so I went with his judgment. But he we went and, and, and walked around. And I, I think the estate itself wasn't quite as run down feeling as I as I as I had in my head. But I knew that, you know, with our department we can make it a little bit more, a little bit worse. We were walking around, but it was when we found and then he, he said, Derek said, right, come and have a look at this. And we walked around the corner and there was that pedestrian tunnel. And I looked at that and I was like, right. And I and I and I, I uh, and I had my uh, 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 art director, uh, my production designer with me. And I said, okay, can we build a playground here so it's right next to because the scenes in the playground, if they're right next to that, and suddenly the whole thing came together and it was like, and suddenly I was like, yes, this is the place, this is the place to do it. And and then so, yes, and off we went. But that was my location manager totally suggested that and sold me on it. But yeah, yeah that was in what? Yeah, because I was watching the movie and I was just thinking because a lot of the scenes are filmed there and it's outside. Did exactly. you film early in the morning to avoid people because? No, we shot, I mean, for, for first of all, that's why that wasn't the section I attempted with no money. Because mm. uh, I knew, you know, like, you know, it's like, you know, if you're inside in an enclosed space, you've got control over everything. If you're outside in an estate, somewhere like that, you need the crew, you need people to help you. You need the permission so that if you have any aggro from anyone, you. you you're legally allowed to be there, you know, all that sort of stuff. And that all costs money. So, so that's why I knew that section of the movie would have to be done with, with money. Um, so, um, uh, um, so yeah, so, but, but because we were shooting January, uh, yeah, uh, February, we, should, well, we started shooting on 30th of January uh, through February. Uh, so we were there for five, six, seven, we spent seven, days on the estate and with and what we did was split days so like interior stuff and daytime stuff we would we would start shooting uh, late morning and go through till and then obviously at that time of year come four o'clock it's getting dark so then we could switch to doing all the night stuff and we were wrapping by you know by 10 o'clock so so we were we were we were basically shooting from 10 till 10 and and but designing the day so that we were shooting all our all that stuff all the interior day stuff all the stuff on the estate that was daytime and then splitting it with the night so it, it was about all that because again if we started going past 11 o'clock outside on an estate where people were living you know you can get complaints yeah rightly so because we are out there making a lot of noise we've we've with strange guys in, uh, in in scary hoods running around, so um, so I very I very carefully designed it the schedule to work that way, 
So we were wrapped by 10 o'clock, half past 10 every night. Right, right. How easy did you find it to keep to the stretch schedule in that case? How, how well did that all work? To keep to the, the schedule? The schedule, yeah. Uh, it, um, surprisingly well. Um, surprisingly well. I'm, um, because I, I, I'm the producer as well, and I'm, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, taking care of the money. I know what we're spending money on, what we're not, and blah, blah, blah. So, so, I, so I can build it and structure it, and I know what's possible. Um, I was able to keep a very tight uh, uh, handle on that. Um, but what that means is, as well, is as a director, you, if you're shooting a scene that you, that you scheduled to finish, you know, say nine o'clock, and there was going to be another, you know, two hours of the end of the day to do something else. And if that scene is going over and, ta and taking longer, mm -hmm. you don't rush it. You don't suddenly go, oh, my God. What you do is you say, right, that stuff we we're going to shoot later. We're not going to do that today. I'm going to rethink that. I'm going to think about doing that quicker sometime else. So you, so, you, so it is fluid. You, the schedule is fluid. But as long as you're making the right decisions and you know, creatively, um, knowing, knowing practically you can make up for it somewhere else, um, that's kind of the way. That's my philosophy anyway. Right. And my... Right. My my and and Bob the DP and 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 my my fantastic first James we they understood that that's how I thought and they totally were fine with me turning around and saying guys we're going to spend longer on this we're going to drop that we're going to figure that out another time um, and yeah and in the end and obviously you know you're going to have a few days of pickups a little bit later so a few things get pushed back to then and uh, yeah and that, that that's how you do it I mean the for example, when we were shooting the playground scene where the girls, where the, where the guys were running off and the girls are left there on their own, that whole stuff of the girls left there on their own is a, was shot about three months later in a completely different location. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> because I knew that we weren't going to get to that section that night, let's concentrate on on making this stuff look as good as it can be. And, we're, and, that, and for that section, I only need those three actresses. So we can call them back in pickups and do it. So, yeah, you kind of make those on the fly decisions, but that that helps you keep on track with the schedule yeah. and keep it sort of keep control of it. And it, it never never once did I feel that it's getting out. You know, oh my god, I'm, you know, it's losing control. Um, it all felt very manageable. But more importantly, on top of that, at the end of every day, we we all turned to each other and said, "Wow, we got some great stuff today." This was a really good day. We go, you know, every day we're walking away so happy with yeah. the shots we'd gotten and what how the movie was looking. Right, right. Okay, so a couple of questions. We're, we're actually drawing to the end of our hour. Okay, uh, I'll <laughs> <you>. Sorry. <laughs> like, you know, it always happens, you know. <laughs> what happens? Um, this is from Kim. Who would you consider your biggest influence going back to music? your biggest influence in music, be it a composer or mainstream musician? Who do you think is your biggest influence? Um, it's, I mean, uh, there's two answers. That, I mean, I suppose there's the answer to this specific film mm -hmm. and then in general. Um, in this specific film, I was definitely, I was definitely, my, my remit to myself was to do cross, a, a cross between John Carpenter and Van Gelis. That was, that was my, my aim to do that which <laughs> judge for yourself if i got anywhere near that. but um but those were those were the guys sitting on my shoulder while i was doing that but if there's one guy that was also sitting on my shoulder and he sits on my shoulder when i do anything it was jerry goldsmith jerry goldsmith is my favorite composer of all time and uh his scores to me are are sublime and and he was fantastic at he did the lush orchestral stuff and he also did great synth stuff as well in the 80s and and he he he's probably my my biggest influence and favorite composer um obviously you know there's so many other composers that are great like someone like john williams for example who you know he, he's probably the most famous composer that's ever lived now and he's you know deserves the accolades he can get but when I'm writing myself, it's it's Jerry Goldsmith. I think that I'm sort of channeling, um, and um, and I'm 
and I, I hate to be cliche, um, but I do I do think a little bit Lennon and McCartney as well when it comes to putting chords and melody together. Lennon and McCartney they 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 knew what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they wrote a few good tunes between yeah, the two of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, you, we, you, you've mentioned before that you'd worked with your sales agent uh, on this. Um, how are you doing on distribution? Do we have any dates? Um, no, nothing to report yet. Um, mm -hmm. Mainly because we're we're still kind of we're still kind of sort of finishing the film off. We've got the deliverables still to create, and there's all kinds of cash flow issues that mean that we we can't start on that and. For another couple of weeks and things like that so but what uh but the but movie house now have the have their own screener of the movie that they can start taking out right to distributors that have already shown interest to them back in back in the can days of, uh when when we had uh the trailers and everything to show them and there was some interest obviously I, i'm not gonna i can't name any names because sure. Nothing is set in stone yet, um, but there are, you know, we'll see as soon as there's any news on that. Obviously, I, I'm going to be yelling it from the hills. So, <laughs> so I'm on I mean, the Facebook, your Facebook group now and things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. I'll link it all together so anyone that's interested will, 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 will know. We've done, like, we had the Fright Fest screening. We did another screening in Soho a week ago. Um, uh, the BFI are going to be screening it um, next month. Um, and we've had uh, uh, the the British Council are showing it as there's a bunch of British movies they show to the Sundance Selection, Selection Committee. Um, so that it's been chosen for that. Um, wow. That's a long shot. I'm not expecting Sundance to take it at all, but it's great to at least be considered. Yeah. In that way. And um, and the and we've had interest from the Paris International Fantasy Film Festival who uh, are looking at the movie right now with a an, uh, with a possibility that they might take nap the French premiere in December. Um, but that, except that none of that is, is uh, but that's all festival stuff, so I can kind of talk about that. But distribution-wise, um, until we, we, we know what's going on. But Movie House, you know, that's their job now. They, they've got the movie. They're, they're, they've got to go out and uh, roll up, roll up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, sell, yeah. Sell yeah, but, uh, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully soon we'll have some news. Good, 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 good. And Kim's last question. Um, thank you so much for chipping in, Kim. Yeah, what, thanks, Kim. <laughs> good questions. Yeah. What film or director was your inspiration for Hallow's Eve? It's yeah, I mean, it's John Carpenter. It's mm. like a hundred percent. It's John Carpenter, but um, and and that's deliberate, and it's. It's in the movie. It's you know, if you know John Carpenter movies, you're going to see references all over the shop, some blatant. Um, but um, but it, but that's kind of you know because you know, you've seen the movie, mm. you know that it, it's it's actually about it reveals itself to be a different kind of movie. Mm -hmm. um, so so I felt that I can I can allow myself to indulge that homaging quite a lot because that's not really what the movie's about. Um, but I can sort of you know take the audience off in a certain direction with that um but um uh but i would certainly also say that uh when i was when I'm chatting with uh with robert my dp and we we're talking about lighting um we did reference dario argento quite a lot um now we oh, didn't go as extreme as his as his Giallo stuff with the with the real primary colors but whereas he would be you know you know, sort of blue and red. We were we were kind of clashing blue with orange, and we were we were doing a lot of that stuff. So if you if you look for it, you should see some of that influence in there as well. So so Carpenter definitely and Dario Argento was definitely a, a bit of a uh, an influence on it as well. Interesting, very interesting. Cool. All right. Well, that's we're two minutes to eight o'clock. I don't really? need to <laughs> Very, really quick. I'm sorry. No. I tend to do that. Sorry. <laughs> That's what makes you a great guest, Brad. That <laughs> means I can just sit here and enjoy myself listening to you. That, yeah, I fine. thought I saw you disappear a few times. Go and come back with a cup of coffee. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, the dog's not come up to find out what's going on, so we're doing fine. Oh, so um, we're doing okay. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Brad, thank you very much indeed. 
uh, for joining me. Um, I look forward to hearing more about more screenings and so on. Um, and you'll keep us updated on that. Uh, for those of you who are watching, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, for anybody who subscribed to the YouTube channel this week, thank you very much indeed. That really does help. Um, Brad mentioned the chattering with Nicholas Vince group on uh, Facebook. Please if you haven't already, come and join us on that. And otherwise, I look forward to see, listening to you, watching, hearing questions from some of you when I'm talking to Sean Robert Smith and Craig Conway from Broken next week. Okay. Excellent. Good night, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. Right. We're going to.